we have now is a cultural failure to clearly communicate so that Americans fully understand the new economic reality behind this skills and job disconnect. Well, if you came out of high school in 1973, there were a lot of jobs for you. If you graduate from high school today and you're looking for those 1973 jobs, you have a problem because they're gone. Because all that wonderful technology that we have and is coming has eliminated them. And we now take a look at what's needed. By 2020, there aren't going to be many jobs left for less than high school. But there they have new technologies to pick lettuce using robots, new technology coming online to pick grapes using robots. But what they don't have is enough young people who can man run the robots, repair the robots, use the computers to run the technologies. So across this country, North Dakota, I see farmers now with machines where they're guiding four or five different threshing and reaping machines using robotic technologies. And in fact, soon they won't even have to be in the field at all. They'll be in the control center. But they too lack the technicians, enough technicians in North Dakota to repair that equipment if it breaks down or to reprogram that equipment. Now they're making great strides because North Dakota started diversifying its job economy in the early 90s. We've always been a problem. We're the baby boomers. See, we're that elephant inside the python. We've always been a problem. We entered, there were too many of us. I mean, I was in a uh, uh, grammar school in eighth grade with 54 kids in my classroom. When we entered the workforce, there was too many of us. When I went out to get my PhD, originally in American history, there were 5,000 PhDs in American history driving taxi cabs. So I didn't get my doctorate in American history. We've produced this titanic bulge, and now guess what we're doing? 70 million of us are retiring in this decade. We face a huge talent challenge. By the time all of us retire, 79 million. Behind us, a smaller generation. The X's, Y's are a little better. But unfortunately, they're less job ready. Now that doesn't make any sense. Look at the unemployment rate right now. Look at the differentiation between the high pay, high skill, and the low pay, low skill. And it's gonna get a lot worse. Here's what's going on in employment right now. Look at the 55-year-olds. Now, look at what's going on with the primary market, 25 to 54. The labor participation rate now in the United States has fallen to the lowest level in 38 years. It's at the historic low. There are people today who are staying home, who have low skills, who can't either get training or won't be training. And they are making more money staying at home on food stamps, on welfare, than they are with the low pay, low skilled jobs they can get. 500,000 people quit with looking for work last month. We are falling off a talent cliff. We have all these unemployed, we have this tiny workforce, and yet we have 7.1 million vacant jobs, which is up by 2 million in the last 12 months. These are the numbers of the destruction of our economy. We wish to see the middle class eliminated. We're on that road. And our prediction by 2020, if this continues, is anywhere from 14 to 25 million vacant jobs. Now we're halfway to the lower number. And I predict there will be communities that are already reinventing themselves, as you'll see in a moment. And then there are those that will just hold on to the status quo. They will be the ones that will suffer the most. So let's look at solutions. Well, there's the segue. There's the inventor. And as Dean has said, it's uh, the technology is the easy part. It's changing the culture, the expectations of people and their thinking. That's the hard part. So whether it's an educator, a business person, a parent, 
You all know how the world works, and how it develops, and how it grows. So let's now explore why and how regional talent innovation networks have started up and are changing people's attitudes and moving the education and job culture. Well, there are the different talent ages that I talked about, the computer age and the cyber metal age. How do you get started? Well, you've got to overcome three cliches to set up in your system. The first one is, hey, timing is everything. Well, the retains are successful, I have found, when the pain of maintaining the employment status quo and running the schools in the way they're run now and businesses in the way they're run has become greater than enabling major systemic change. When the pain of not changing exceeds the pain of collaboration. Right next to you. Or what you will do here in your county. They align. They try to align the resources in the community. This is not about school reform. This is about systemic reform and structural change. There are many services in your community that now are fragmented or are all competing for the same money that serve people who are handicapped, people who are elderly, people who are coming out of the criminal justice system. And you need many of these workers if they became part of the system. So it's, it's more than just business school collaboration. And finally, they execute, and they measure results, and they evaluate. This is a very exhaustive process, and most of these retains have gone through many different cycles of development. So it's not a plan, it's not a project either. This is meant to change the system. It's meant to restructure. There is the mission. It's, inter it's an intermediary. The retain does not set up a new governing body. You already have enough. You have enough bureaucracy already. What it's trying to do is set up a voluntary organization to get groups to work together and fill in the blanks and do a better job of what is going on in the workplace and in the classroom and in the community. And this really is what is implementation of regional service delivery systems. And what's going to work here may not work well in Mansfield or in Columbus. There will be regional differences within your state. Part of it is driven by what you're willing to do. This calls for an investment of time, treasure, and talent on the part of everybody in this room. And it is systemic, from top to bottom. Too many school reform and education reform programs concentrated on one area of this path. And unfortunately, they are, go back, they're all interconnected. And to put all our money in early childhood, or all our money in career academies, or all our money in adult literacy, or all our money into e-learning computer or STEM programs in elementary or secondary school. These are good things, but unfortunately, there is no magic bullet. There's the retain model. All of these groups together. Today, I started with a briefing for business owners and their concerns and their fears, and what they need. This keynote is mainly to familiarize you with retains. This afternoon, I'm going to talk to you professional educators about your needs, your concerns, and your fears. And they're real. And I understand that. But I do the same with parents. I do the same with nonprofits to help you set up a regional network, this intermediary. 
And I want you to look very carefully at that chart. We're not talking about a liberal arts education or career prep. We're talking about both. We're talking about a longer school day and a longer school year. No one said life in the 21st century is going to be easier in terms of what you need to know. We know, people sitting here, you need to know more, not less. And being an electrician or a carpenter, I submit to you, as a son of a carpenter, is just as complex as being a college professor in its own right. And it's just as professional. And for our society to continue to denigrate technology is a one-way ticket to oblivion, because other countries will take that technology from us. I work now for major Fortune 500 companies. If we do not produce the talent here, those airplanes can be built in Singapore. Those computers can be built in England or Germany. They don't have to stay here. They'll leave. We cannot run that risk. These are real threats. Also, it helps to build a neutral network. What do I mean by that? This civic space where the retain meets is not controlled by the largest school district, the most powerful corporation, the foundation that has the most money. It's controlled by the people of the community. It's a neutral place. This is not a project of Bill Gates. This is not a project of the governor. This is your future in your hands. It's called civic activism. It's a shared vision. This is what they do. Regional Career Information and Education, K-12. And when I mean career and uh, information and education, I'm also talking about upgrading and improving the teaching of social studies, English literature, writing skills, math, and science. It's not an either or proposition. And American students aren't stupid. They can and they will respond to this if the standards are raised. And parents will too. Do parents want their children raised to live in poverty? Most don't, some do. And you will always have rough, sore necks in the back of the room that will never agree to anything. Put them aside. That is not the majority of people who live in this community. I know that, or I wouldn't be here now. Also, we're talking about regional career education, information dissemination, so that starting with first graders, parents understand the job, culture, and educational needs of their society and of their region. And they begin to be educated with the educators, the teachers, the variety of careers that exist today that simply did not exist when we were in school. And then finally, the continued training and retraining of current people in the workforce. And this includes teachers. The amount of in-service the average teacher is given today is a joke. They cannot keep up. They are not given the adequate time to study and to improve their skills. Some districts do, but most do not. And if yours does, I bite my tongue. They are professionals. They need to be treated as professionals. You know, I get tired when I stand before a business audience. And the only reason they respect me is because I'm president of Imperial Consulting Corporation. And when I stand before teachers and educators, the only reason they respect me is I have a PhD and taught in universities. I get tired of it because these are important parts of our world. We are not a communist country. Capitalism is important. It pays the salaries of teachers. At the same time, education is important because it gives you the human capital to run your businesses. We have lost sight of this. Our culture has lost sight of this, and we need to stop it. You know, during the, the Depression, when we talk about this shared vision through civic activism, there was a mayor in New York. His name was Fiorella LaGuardia. He was a very flamboyant mayor. His name meant Little Flower. He was really, he grew up, he was born in New York, he grew up in Arizona. 
he would many times during his term in office, he'd show off the night court and he would take over the police night court. And he'd judge who was right and wrong and what the sentences would be. Well, one night a grocer charged a mother, this was during the Great Depression, who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her three children. LaGuardia asked the frightened woman, are you guilty or not guilty? She cheerfully responded, guilty. LaGuardia told the crowded courtroom that the penalty for her crime was either a $10 fine or 10 days in jail. Now, $10 may seem nothing today, but it was a small fortune for people in the Depression. I know, my parents grew up in it. He then said to the lady, I find you guilty as charged and find you $10. He then reached into his pocket and he took out a $10 bill and he placed it in a hat. And he leaned down from the bench and he gave her the money. Furthermore, I also find everyone in this courtroom 50 cents because if we reach the stage in America when a mother has to steal bread to feed her family, then the rest of us have a civic responsibility to help her out and to make sure this doesn't happen again. They passed the hat, they collected $47.50. The mother kept that and gave 50 cents to the grocer for the loaf of bread. That's what civic activism is all about. Sharing, sharing and supporting a shared vision. Do you have that vision? Are you willing to work together? Or do you still just want to have your enemies list and throw mud at each other? I think you do have that shared vision. I think you want your community to thrive and grow. The Tribune had an interesting piece about that shared vision. And it talked about this is what really made America great. People coming together. Now I'm not talking about the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm not talking about who you're going to run for governor or president. I'm talking about this community, this county. Do we have that or have we lost it? I think you have it. Or your community leaders thus far, and they want to grow into a bigger group, when they've invited me here today. shared vision. Rebuilding the pipeline. There is the pipeline. All the pieces of that pipeline. They are all equally important. Look at who are involved. Back that up. And you fall into different categories. All of you. You're there. And again, it is this interlocking system. You can't just take one piece and elevate it. 